Hello and welcome to Let's Play Legend of Zagor by Ian Livingstone. And let's read the blurb quickly. And the evil that will not die. Zagor, the very name of the warlock of Firetop Mountain, strikes terror into all who hear it. Banished from the world of Titan, the sorcerer is slowly but surely regaining his strength. Within Castle Argent, in the kingdom of Amarillia, Zagor has been transformed into a demon. Um, such is his power, he must be destroyed. Uh, there are several adventurers willing to volunteer. Mighty Anvar, the barbarian, uh, the warrior Braxus, Stubble, the dwarf, um, or Salazar, the wizard. But only one will be chosen. Are you that hero? Fighting Fantasy, the world's most popular adventure game book series. Cover illustrations by Ian Barnes and Martin McKenna. And there's a picture of Ian Livingstone. Um, he is now a multi-millionaire. Um, he is one of the co-founders of Games Workshop, which sells things related to Warhammer. Um, I still don't really know what Warhammer is, um, apart from being little plastic figures. Um, apart from that, I, I don't know what it is. Um, although it must be really popular, because um, it has whole shops um, dedicated just to selling that. So um, it must be really popular, but um, I don't really know what it is, to be honest. Um, I remember walking past it when I was younger and seeing the name Games Workshop and thinking that it might sell video games, but uh, I was sadly disappointed. Anyway, there's the front cover, um, Legend of Zagor. Uh, there are the uh, the, uh, the four warriors. Um, I think that's Anvar, that's Braxus. Oh, he looks like an old man there for some reason. There's the dwarf, and there's um, Salazar, who looks a little bit like a clown. Um, I don't know why he looks like a clown, but uh, um, I think that's Salazar, anyway. Anyway, so um, Zagor has been turned into a demon this time, and, and we have to stop him for the umpteenth time. Okay, um, Legend of Zagor. Zagor, the very name of the Warlock of Firetop Mountain, that strikes terror into all who hear it. Banished from the world of Titan by a... Um, by a heroic adventurer, the sorcerer is slowly but surely regaining his strength in another land, far, far away. Within Castle Argent, in the kingdom of Amarillia, Zagor has been transformed into a demon. I don't know why demon is capitalised, but it is. Um, soon his magical powers will know no bounds. Um, unless a new hero can be found in time, Zagor will unleash his... Um, his... What does that say? His, what does that say? His ata, I don't, I don't know what that says. It's too blurry to read properly. We'll un, oh, we'll unleash his armies. There we go. Uh, Zagor will unleash his armies upon Amarillia. Yeah. Um. It looks like the, uh, it looks like the R and the M are, are T's. I, anyway, I'll start again. Um. Unless a new hero can be found in time, Zagor will unleash his armies upon Amarillia. There are several adventurers willing to volunteer. Mighty Anvar the Barbarian, the Warrior Braxus, Stubble the Dwarf, and Salazar the Wizard. But only one will be chosen to venture into Castle Argent and destroy Zagor once and for all. Are you that hero? Two dice, a pencil and an eraser are all you need to embark on this astonishing adventure, which comes complete with its own elaborate combat system and a score sheet to record your progress. Many dangers lie ahead, and your success is anything but certain. It's up to you to decide which route to follow, which dangers to risk, and which foes to fight. Be warned, you have never faced a challenge like this before. Okay, I'll just uh, zoom out now. Uh, let's, let's start reading this. There's a list of all the books up to the, the current one. Um, yep. Illustrated by Martin McKenna. Okay, uh, published. When was this published? 1993. Oh, it's not that. Uh, uh, it's not that old. Well, relative to me, anyway. Um, okay. Introduction. Um, before embarking. On your adventure, um, you must first determine your strengths and weaknesses. These are partly determined by dice. Uh, you must initially choose a hero. I don't know why hero is capitalised, but it is. Um, a hero to play in the adventure. Um, first, you may wish to read through this introduction and the background which follows, and then return here to make the choice of which character to play. Um, I already know which one I'm going to play. Um, I've got a comment on part 5 of Return to Firetop Mountain. Um, by someone called William is an idiot. Um, yeah, his name is William is an idiot. That's right. Um, 
and he has a picture of Hillary Clinton looking a bit silly. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, he left a comment uh, asking when I do uh, when I do this book, um, can I please be the wizard? So I'm, go I'm going to be the wizard, um, and that's also the hardest and, and the most interesting one, I think. I think Anvar and Braxis are pretty common because they're both pretty much warriors. Although uh, Braxis is more of the all-round character, uh, uh, the dwarf is is a bit. Um, he isn't as different from the main two as the wizard is, so I'm going to use the wizard. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, so as he asked, um, I'm going to be the wizard. Anyway, um, uh, your options are um, Anvar the Barbarian. Um, as a barbarian, you are immensely tough and resilient. Hardened by years of living, hunting and travelling in hills and mountains, you are as skillful a fighter as any in the land of Amarillia, and you are proud of your skill. Um, you know almost nothing of the ways of magic, though, and in all truth you don't much care for it. Magic is the affair of book-reading milk sops. Um, you prefer a good, clean fight, and you fear nothing and no man. What about torture with electricity? He must fear that. Or maybe electricity doesn't exist. Okay, torture with fire. There we go. I'm sure, you know, um, I'm sure he'd, he'd fear that. Um, I can't imagine why you wouldn't fear that, to be honest. Anyway, um, Braxis the Warrior. Uh, your name bespeaks your honour. It is the name of a long-dead Amarillian king, and who knows, noble blood may flow in your veins too. Uh, you are as skillful a warrior as any barbarian, and while you are slightly less resilient, you are better able to use magic. Uh, perhaps the most versatile... Of any type of, um, I'll start again. Uh, perhaps the most versatile of any type of adventurer, you are skilled with sword and bow and able to use magical weapons to best effect. Okay, stubble the dwarf. Grumpy and tetchy you may be. Um, stubble trouble is a common warning among those who know you. Um, but a tough warrior you certainly are. Uh, you have that native streak of good luck which many dwarfs from Grandia possess, um, and when exploring dungeons and mines you have some special advantages mere humans do not possess. Um, you'll use magic if you have to, but you prefer to put your faith in your trusty axe. Okay, lastly, um, Salazar the Wizard. No bard will ever sing epic tales of your prowess with weapons, but what does that matter? Um, you are a master of magic. You can command spells to avoid, confuse, weaken or defeat enemies. And you know how to use magical items in ways mere warriors could not. Um, you are an adventurer of guile and stealth. And if you are forced to fight, well, you will not die easily at the hands of, at the hands of any enemy. By a quirk of fate, you have the same name as the one-time Grand Wizard of Amarillia. And you immodestly aspire to his rank if not his tragic fate. On pages 32 to 5 there are adventure sheets which you may use to record the details of your chosen character. Um, on it you will find boxes for recording your skill, stamina, luck and magic point scores. You are advised either to record your scores on the adventure sheet in pencil or to make photocopies of the sheet for use in future adventures. Okay, here we go. Okay, so as I said, um, I'm going to be Salazar, so that's a given, so there's no, that's a decision made. Um, so now we're going to sort out the skill, stamina, luck and magic. Skill, roll one dice, I don't like that, it's die. You see, that's what I was talking about. Um, when it's Ian Livingstone on his own, he's more like, well, in his books, in most of his books that are written just by him, he, he uses dice instead of die, which, which I don't like, so I'm going to say die instead. Um, and roll one die. If you are Anvar or Braxis, add six to the number rolled. If you are Stubble, add five to the number rolled. If you are Salazar, add four to the number rolled. Enter your total in the skill box on the adventure sheet. Okay, now we need this to be five, uh, or rather to be nine plus. So I'm afraid I'm going, I can't get anything less than six or five, so... I'm going to have to keep doing this until I get a 5 or a 6. No. Yes, there we go. We've got a 6. Right. Let's get rid of the uh, the buzzing. There we go. Actually, we need it for 2 next time, don't we? Okay, so we add 4 because we're Salazar. And that means... Um, 
and our skill is now 10 um, is currently 10 so that's that there's no you know I have it on good authority that we need it to be at least nine so I'm not going to you know because this is a difficult book I'm not going to make it more difficult for myself okay and now for the stamina um, each character determines his stamina differently if you're Anvar roll one die and add 18 to the number rolled if you are Braxis or Stubble roll two dice and add 12 to the total roll uh, rolled. If you're Salazar, roll three dice and add uh, six to the total. Okay, now we need it to be 16 plus. Uh, so we're going to roll three dice and add six to the total. Enter the complete total in the stamina box on the adventure sheet. Okay, roll three dice and add six to the total. Okay, so uh, let's roll one die at a time. Yeah, let's do that. Um, yeah, because I. I'll, uh, Oh no! Wait a minute. I can choose three dice with this awful dice program that I use. So I, I'll do that actually. Okay. So we need it to be. What do we do? Add what to the total? And add six to the total. Okay. Add six to the total. Uh, yeah. So we need it to be at least sixteen. So we need this to be three dice to be at least sixteen, really. Which one button? Um. Yep. Yeah. What? Five, two, and one. That's not happening. No, 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 no. I could be here all day. No, 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 no. What do you do? There we go, 18. I didn't really want three sixes, but that's the first one that's come that isn't lower than than, than 16. Uh, right, okay. 18, we're adding six to the total, and then we're getting... Uh, that means 24, doesn't it? I didn't mean to get maximum there, but oh well. Okay, so 24 for that. That's maximum. Okay, keep going. Roll one die. If you're Stubble, add five to the number rolled. If you're Anvar, add four to the number rolled. If you're Braxis or Salazar, add three to the number rolled. End your total in the luck box in the adventure sheet. Okay. Um, okay, so... I want as maximum as possible, so I don't really want one, but I will accept two. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we're rolling one die, and then we're adding three to the number rolled <clears throat> because we're Salazar. Okay, so one die. That's not bad. Okay. Um, so four plus uh, three is seven, so let's write down seven for uh, luck. And now we need a new uh, th um, new category for magic. Because that's a, that's a thing we have to do in this. Okay, um, magic points. Your character starts adventure with a certain number of magic points. If you are Anvar, you have one magic point. If you are Braxis, you have three magic points. If you are Stubble, you have two magic points. If you are Salazar, you have seven magic points. That's the advantage of being Salazar. So we have seven, that's good. Okay, let's move on. Um, for reasons that will be explained below, skill, stamina, luck and magic point scores change constantly during an adventure. You must keep an accurate record of these scores and for this reason you are advised either to write small in the boxes or to keep an eraser handy. But never rub out your initial scores. Although you may be awarded additional skill, stamina, luck and magic points, these totals may never exceed your initial scores except on very rare occasions when you will be instructed to this effect on a particular page. Your skill score reflects your swordsmanship and general fighting expertise, the higher the better. Your stamina score reflects your general constitution, your will to survive, your determination and overall fitness. The higher your stamina, the longer you, you will be able to survive. Your luck score indicates how naturally lucky a person you are and whether you are able to avoid certain hazards and perils during your adventure. Your magic points score is a measure of how effectively you are able to use spells and magical items you may find along the way, and also how adept you are at avoiding magical traps and hazards. Luck and magic are very much facts of life in, in the fantasy kingdom you are about to explore. Okay, I'm, I'll try to speed read this, a bit like small print, because I know people have heard it before, but I am going to read it through for the benefit of those people who haven't, who haven't, uh, haven't seen any, any of my other fighting fantasy videos. Okay, battles. You'll often come across paragraphs in the book which instruct you to fight a creature of some sort. An option to flee may be given, but if it is not, or if you choose to attack the creature anyway, you must resolve the battle as described below. First, record the creature's skill and stamina scores in the first vacant monster encounter box on your adventure sheet. The scores for each creature are given each time you have an encounter. 
The sequence of combat is then. Roll two dice once for the creature and and add its skill score. The total is the creature's attack strength. Roll two dice once for yourself. Add the number rolled to your current skill score. This total is your, is your attack strength. If your attack strength is higher than that of your opponent, you have wounded it, proceed to step four. If the creature's attack strength is higher than yours, it has wounded you, proceed to step five. If both attack strengths are the same, you have avoided, avoided each other's blows. Start the next attack round from step one above. Step four, you have wounded the creature, so you subtract two points from its stamina score. You may use your luck here to, uh, to do additional damage. See below, proceed to step six. The creature has wounded you, so subtract two points from your own stamina score. Again, you may use luck at this stage. See below. Okay, step six, make the appropriate adjustments to either the creature's or your own stamina score and to your luck score if you used luck. See below. Now, step seven, begin the next attack round by returning to step one. This sequence continues until the stamina score of either you or the creature you are fighting has been reduced to zero or below, which is death. Okay, fighting more than one creature. If you come across more than one creature in a particular encounter, the instructions on that page will tell you whether you must fight the creatures one at a time or all together. If you're instructed to fight the creatures singly, uh, the battle proceeds exactly as described above. However, if you defeat the first creature listed, you must then immediately begin fighting the second creature on the list. You, you fight the creatures one at a time, but you must continue fighting until all your creatures are slain or until you are. Uh, you may not pause between fighting different creatures for any reason, such as taking some steps to restore your stamina points. If you are instructed to fight all the creatures together, you must fight all of them in one battle. In step one of the combat sequence above, you must calculate attack strength for all, uh, for all the creatures attacking you. In step three, if the attack strength of any of your opponents is higher than yours, you must proceed to step five. If you have the highest attack strength of all, proceed to step four, and you may choose which of your opponents you have struck. Again, combat proceeds until either you or all of your, or all of your enemies are, are slain. Luck. At various times during adventure, either in battles or when you find yourself in a situation in which you could be either lucky or unlucky, uh, details of these are given in the relevant paragraphs. You may call on your luck to make the outcome more favourable to you. But beware, using luck is a risky business, and if you are unlucky, the results could be disastrous. The procedure for using your luck is as follows. Roll two dice. If the number rolled is less than or equal to your current luck score, you have been lucky, and the result will go in your favour. If the number rolled is higher than your current luck score, you have been unlucky, and you will be penalised. Uh, this procedure is known as testing your luck. Each time you test your luck, regardless of the outcome, you must subtract one point from your current luck score. Thus, you will soon realise that the more you rely on your luck, the more risky this will become. Simple, but very clever, I always think. Um, using luck in battles. In certain paragraphs of this book, you'll be told that you must test your luck and you'll be told the consequences of being lucky or unlucky. However, in battles, you always have the option of using your luck, either to inflict more serious damage on a creature you have just wounded or to minimise the effects of a wound your opponent has just inflicted on you. If you've just wounded your opponent, you may test your luck as described above. If you, if you are lucky, you have inflicted a severe wound and may subtract an extra two points from the creature's stamina score. However, if you are unlucky, the wound was a mere graze and you must restore one point of the creature's stamina so that instead of scoring the normal two points of damage, you have now scored only one. If the creature has just wounded you, you may test your luck to try to minimise the wound. If you are lucky, you have managed to avoid the full damage of the blow, restore one point of stamina, so that instead of causing two points of damage, it has caused only one. If you are unlucky, you have taken a more serious blow, subtract one extra stamina point from your current total. Remember that you must subtract one point from your own luck scores each time you test your luck whether you are successful or not. Testing your skill. From time to time your advent uh, during your adventure you will find yourself in a situation in which your physical strength, of, uh, reflexes and agility may affect whether you are able to avoid some hazard or perform some action, such as climbing a difficult and treacherous surface. When this is the case, you will often be instructed to test your skill. The procedure for this is as follows. Roll two dice, so the total roll is less than or equal to your current skill score, you have been successful. If the total is greater than your current skill score, you have failed. The relevant paragraphs will tell you what success and failure mean when you test your skill. However, you do not have to subtract any points from your skill score for testing your skill in this way. This is a crucial way in which testing your skill is different from testing your luck. Sometimes you may have to face a difficult task in which your skill is tested to the full. For example, you may be instructed to test your skill adding two to the number rolled. What this means is that when you roll two dice, you, may, uh, you must add two to the total. If you had rolled a four and a three, say, your modified total would be four plus three plus two, which equals nine. You then compare this final total with your skill to discover the outcome of testing your skill. Testing your spot skill. Uh, this is a special case of testing your skill which applies when you may or may not discover spot something hidden or concealed. The procedure here is exactly the same as for testing your skill but the relevant paragraphs will instead test, uh, instead instruct you to test your spot skill. Magic points. Magic points are used in two ways in this adventure. They are used for casting spells and for using magical items. Some important magic items 
Um, you may find on your adventure you need to be primed with magic in order to make them function. If you find such an item, uh, you must subtract one from your current magic point score in order to be able to use it. Thereafter, you can use the magic item as instructed. If you do not have any magic points and you, and you find such a magic item, you may choose to keep the item and make a note of its powers. Later in the adventure, you may be able to gain one or more magic points notably from magic rings and if you do you um, you will then be able to use the magic item um, any adventurer may use magic items during this adventure although some magic items may not be usable by all adventure by all adventurers the description of the magic item will state who can and who cannot use it all adventurers can also cast magic spells from magic scrolls discovered during the adventure uh, the adventure although one magic point must be sent must be spent to cast a spell from the scroll um, However, Salazar alone knows a number of spells which are described in the Amarillian Grimoire. Uh, um, I think that's how I pronounce it. Uh, below, and he alone can use any of these spells, provided he has enough magic points, of course. The description of each of these spells explains when and where it may be used and its effects. If you choose to have Salazar as your adventurer, you may wish to photocopy the spell book for easy reference when playing the adventure. Or write it down. Adventurers other than Salazar may sometimes be able to use a spell, usually by finding a magic, um, a magical scroll on which the spell is inscribed. If you find a spell in this way, you should fer you should refer to the Amarillian Grimoire for details of what the spell does. Restoring skill, stamina, luck, and magic points. Your skill score will not change very often during your adventure. Occasionally, a paragraph may give an instruction to increase or decrease your skill score. Your skill score cannot exceed its initial level unless you are specifically instructed to the contrary. You may have the chance during this adventure to acquire items such as a magical weapon which will increase your attack strength. If you manage to, uh, if you manage to acquire two such weapons, you cannot gain bonuses to your attack strength to both of them, so, uh, so that, for example, you cannot use both a magic sword and a magic axe at the same time. Likewise, stronger armor will add a bonus to your attack strength, and obviously you cannot wear more than one suit of armor at a time. Unless it's chain mail and then a plate mail, in theory, that that could work. Be, uh, that, uh, that'd be bloody heavy, though. I mean, seriously, you, you'd be sweating pints, even in winter. Okay, it's made a misprint here. It said, stamins and provisions. Your stamina score will go up and down a lot during your adventure as you fight enemies and undertake arduous tasks. As you near your goal, your stamina score may sink dangerously low and battles may become particularly risky. So be careful. Your backpack contains enough provisions for 12 meals. Let's write that down so we don't forget. Provisions 12 and commerce because it will go down. You may rest and eat at any time except when fighting. Eating a meal restores four stamina points. When you eat a meal, add four points to your current stamina score and deduct one from all provisions on your adventure sheet. A separate provisions box is provided on your adventure sheet for recording details of provisions. You have a long way to go, so use your provisions wisely. Uh, remember that your stamina score may never exceed its initial value unless you are sp uh, specifically instructed otherwise in a paragraph. Now, interestingly, it did not say that you can only use one at a time, I think. Yeah, it, didn't, it, it does not say that you can't eat more than one. There will be times during your adventure when you will be told that you must eat a meal. When you have, um, when you have, to, did I read the, wait a minute, you have a long way to go, so use your provisions wisely. Remember that your stamina score may never exceed its initial value unless you are specifically instructed otherwise in a paragraph. I think I did read that. There will be times during your adventure when you will be told that you must eat a meal. When you have to do this, deduct one point from your provisions on your adventure sheet, but do not regain any lost stamina for doing this. If you are told to eat a meal, but you don't have any provisions left, you must subtract two points from your current stamina score. During your adventure, however, you should be able to acquire at least some extra provisions to add to those you began with. Uh, those with which you began. This will enable you to maintain uh, stamina throughout the adventure. However, you cannot carry more than 12 provisions at any one time. Your luck score will also go down during the adventure as you test your luck. Additions to your luck score may be awarded when you have been especially, for especially fortunate. And similarly, you, might, you may be told to reduce your luck when you make an important mistake. Details of such events are given in the appropriate paragraphs of the book. Uh, remember that, as with skill and stamina, your luck may never exceed its initial value unless you are specifically told this. Apart from testing your luck, you will also be given some opportunities for spending luck. You will be asked whether you wish to deduct one, one point from your current luck score in order to increase your chance of a successful outcome. For example, if you are told to make a dice roll, you... 
uh, you may uh, you can often modify it by spending luck. In this case, you might decide whether to spend the luck point before you roll the dice. Of course, luck points are precious, and you cannot afford this luxury very often. Making the right choice about whether to spend a luck point in this way can be important for success in this adventure. Magic points. Your magic points total will decrease each time you find a magical item and use it, or if you cast a spell. During your adventure, however, you, you will find magical places and items which will increase your magic points. However, your magic points score cannot exceed its initial value unless you are specifically instructed to the contrary. Magic points are precious and you do not have very many of them. Um, be sure to use what magic you have wisely and well. Equipment. You start your adventure with some simple basic equipment that you will need for the adventure ahead. You also have some gold pieces and you'll be able to purchase some extra items when the adventure begins. All of the adventures have the following items. A suit of thin leather armor, small shield and a lantern. Okay, let's... Okay. Leather, oh, I've done that wrong, I typed it wrong weather. Leather armor, uh, wooden shield, uh, lantern. What else? Small shield and lanterns allow you to see in the dark. You also have a backpack for carrying items with enough provisions for 12 meals inside it. Uh, you have a small spare knife which you can use if you should ever suffer the misfortune of using your main weapon losing your main weapon, but if you ever have to use this knife to fight with, your blows will cause your opponent to lose only one point from his stamina in combat. Okay, so small knife. Um, if you are Braxis, you also have a sword. If you are Anvar or Stubble, you have a battle axe. If you are Salazar, you carry a strong wooden staff. Okay, so you have a strong wooden staff. Uh, let's go on the next line. Strong wooden staff. There we go. This is the staff announcement. Will, uh, would Jackie come to the checkout, please? Uh, sorry. Um, that was because I, I read the word staff. Anyway. Well, they now call it a colleague announcement. Ugh. Anyway, um, you carry a stringed leather pouch with a number of gold pieces in it. Roll three dice and add two to the total roll. This is how many gold pieces you have with you. Between five and twenty. If you are stubble the dwarf, you have five extra gold pieces. The dwarfish love of gold is well known. Three dice and add two. Okay, whoops, wrong one. Three dice and add two. Eight and add two. I'm not going to do that. I need more. There we go. Eleven and add two. I don't want a one to be in the dice roll. It's not fair. There we go. Fourteen add two. Sixteen. Right, that'll do. Thank you. Ugh. Anyway, so what was it? God, I've gone already. Oh yeah, two sixteen. Right. So we have sixteen gold. And to the, this is how many gold pieces you have with you between five and twenty. Okay. If you are stubble, oh, you read that. You may find treasure in the form of gold pieces or valuable objects or items along the way. Um, or items along the way. Whenever you come across any treasure, you should make a note of it in the treasure box on your adventure sheet. You may find yourself in the position of being able to trade treasure for equipment, help. Or information in this adventure. So be honest, I'll read it again. You may find yourself in the position of being able to trade treasure for equipment, help, or information in this adventure, so be honest and keep an accurate record of how much treasure you acquire. Advantages. Each of the adventurers, Anvar, Braxis, Stubble, and Salazar, has some special advantage which he alone can use. Anvar has a sixth sense, warning him of imminent attacks. Sometimes you will meet a creature or even a trap which is able to surprise you and inflict damage before you're able to attack it yourself. Anvar cannot be surprised, so if a paragraph instructs you to lose stamina points, or if you find yourself trapped in some way because you are surprised, Anvar does not suffer any damage because he is able to react and defend himself in time. Braxis's talent is his versatility. He can freely use all arm and weapons which other adventurers cannot. Therefore, he, he doesn't suffer any of the disadvantages other adventurers have. See disadvantages below. Stubble has a special knowledge of certain underground monsters and how best to strike at them, knowing their weak spots. If you confront a creature with the word stone in its name, like stone statue or stone golem, Stubble can add two to his attack strength when fighting such monsters. Salazar is very perceptive and eagle-eyed. Um, whenever he has to test his spot skill, he can subtract two from the dice roll. 
He is also able to read special magical tomes, and he understands some details of magical runes which other characters do not. Okay, so I'll just write this there. Test, testing, spot, skill, subtract, two from dice roll. Just so I don't forget. Okay, disadvantages. Each adventurer has some weaknesses, limitation or disadvantage which balances his special talent. Anvar is very uncomfortable wearing any kind of metal armour, chain mail or plate mail. It's cumbersome and restrictive. As Anvar, you simply cannot wear plate mail, and while you can tolerate chain mail and wear it, um, you will gain no bonus to your attack strength for using it. Uh, and while you can use a long bow and arrows, you are not trained in the use of a crossbow. If you do use one, you must subtract two from your attack strength. Salazar has a similar problem, but it is more severe. He cannot use chain mail or plate mail armor at all. The wizard could barely move in plate mail. Moreover, Salazar cannot use a crossbow, a long bow, or a two-handed sword. He must keep at least one hand free for spell casting. That makes sense. Stubble cannot use a two-handed sword, it's too big for him, and the longbow is also too large for a dwarf to use. He can wear chain mail, but he cannot use plate mail armour unless it is specifically dwarf sized. If you're not specifically told that a particular set of plate mail armour is dwarf sized, then Stubble cannot use it. Braxus is so versatile he has no such disadvantages. For the other characters, be sure to note the disadvantage which is recorded in the appropriate box on their adventure sheet. Okay, so no plate mail, chain mail, or two-handed sword, or crossbow, or longbow. Okay. No armour whatsoever. And I'll just put no... I'll just put no plate armour, chain mail, crossbow, longbow, or two-handed sword can be used. There we go. Lovely. Plate mail, um, armor at all. Crossbow, longbow, two hundred sword. Yeah, okay. Special treasures. During your perilous quest you may find many treasures. However, in the dungeons where your adventure awaits you, there are several treasures which are similar. The tower chests. Each of these is a small locked wooden casket with a trap placed upon it. Whenever you find one of these tower chests, if you wish to open it, you do not have to do so. You must test your luck. If you're lucky, you open the chest safely. If you're unlucky, you will trigger a scything blade inside the lid, which will slash your arms, and you must deduct three points from your stamina. The trap can be bypassed by using a simple open spell, if you can, which automatically opens the other chest without harming you. Each time you find one of these tower chests and you open it, roll one die. If you roll an odd number, you will find a golden talisman. If you roll an even number, you will find a silver dagger. You may increase your current luck score by one point each time you take a talisman or dagger from a tower chest. Keep a careful record in the talismans and daggers boxes on your adventure sheet of how many of each item you acquire during your adventure. They will be very precious to you in your desperately perilous final battle. If you are fortunate, you may also find one or more magic rings. Each time you find a magic ring, you, re uh, you regain one spent magic point. Obviously, you do not have to spend a magic point to use such a magic ring. If your magic points total is, in it, um, is at its initial level, you can keep the ring and use it once your magic points total has been reduced. You cannot use a magic ring to increase your magic points abo uh, total above its above its initial level. If you, are, if you are lucky enough to find any other magical items, make a note of what, of what each item can do to help you in your quest. Using the right magical item at the right time may make all the difference between failure and glorious success, as opposed to normal success. Special hazards. Among the hazards you may encounter in your quest are plagues and poisons. You may contract one or more forms of plague from the attacks of infested, infected rats or from vampire bats or worse. You will be instructed in the relevant paragraphs what will happen if you contract any form or forms of plague. If you are wretched enough to suffer two or even more kinds of plague at the same time, the effects are cumulative. Be sure to take whatever precautions you can against these dread maladies. Um, seek help and healing without delay should you contract plague. Some of your evil opponents and enemies will even stoop to using poisoned weapons against you. Such weapons will inflict damage doubly, a wound from the weapon itself and extra damage from the, weapon, uh, from the venom or poison smeared on the weapon. Keep a note of damage you sustain both from poison and from 
and from weapon attacks. They will both reduce your stamina. No, they will both reduce your stamina, but the effects of poison may be relieved by specific antidotes and remedies. However, such antidotes will not affect any wounds you may suffer from actual weapon blows. I think we're nearly through this. Your journey, uh, hints on play. Your journey will be perilous and you may well fail at your first attempt. Make notes and draw a map as you explore. A map will prove invaluable in later forays in this adventure and it, and it will enable you to progress more rapidly to unexplored regions. You will be exploring a very large area and sometimes you may wish to retrace your steps in order to revisit places of particular value or to check areas left behind you. Without a map, you may not be able to follow the right path to success. Not all uh, areas contain treasure or useful information. Many contain traps or creatures which you will no doubt um, of which you will no doubt fall foul. You may take wrong turnings during your quest, and while you may indeed progress through to your ultimate destination, it is by no means certain that you will find what you um, you will find for what you are searching. However, the more areas you explore, the better will be your chance. Uh, the better your chances will be. The better will be your chances of success in the adventure ahead. There we go. Be wary about testing your luck unless a paragraph tells you that you must uh, do this. Generally, when it comes to fights, you should test your luck only to keep yourself alive if an opponent's blow would otherwise kill you. The other occasion when you when you should use luck is to inflict extra damage in the final combat against your dire enemy in this adventure. If you've got if you have enough luck left to use, um, well, if you have enough luck left to use. Don't test your luck in order to inflict extra damage upon your enemy unless this is really essential. Luck points are precious. You must collect as many golden talismans and silver daggers as possible during your adventure. However, in order to do this, you will have to explore the dungeons thoroughly, thus risking many more combats with hostile creatures and encountering more traps and hazards. You will have to balance your desire for talismans and daggers against the need to avoid unnecessary combats and hazards. Um... When your resources, provisions, magic points, luck, etc. are beginning to weaken and you cannot replenish them easily, you must try and make for the most direct route to your final enemy, if you know it. To your final enemy, if you know it. Um, seek for ways to swap your treasure for equipment and help during your adventure. Gold pieces are of little use. You, uh, you cannot eat them, use them in combats, or cast spells with them. But they will buy you food, weapons, even magic, if you can find someone with whom to trade. You will soon realise the paragraphs make no sense if read in numerical order. It is essential that you read only the paragraphs you are instructed, uh, to which you are instructed to go. Reading other paragraphs lessens the excitement and surprise during play. The only, the only true way to success in this adventure involves minimising risk. Any player, no matter how weak his or her initial dice rolls, should be able to struggle through to glory in the end. I disagree with that. As always, you need at least... 9 or 10 skill and pretty um, um, pretty good stamina, above 16 really. The Amarillion Grim, uh, Grimoire, um, I'll read this when I, ne uh, when I need to really because I can't be bothered to read it now. But yeah, various spells and they all cost different, uh, um, they're different numbers of magic points so use them when you need to. Background. It is five long and weary years since the armies of the Bone Demon laid waste. Yeah, there's no point in reading the Grimoire now because I won't remember it. I'll have to read it when I need it. It is five long and weary years since the armies of the Bone Demon laid waste uh, so much of the beautiful, perilous land of Amarillia. The zombies and orcs which infested the plains of the land were foul enough, but the demons, war dragons, slew thousands of men, dwarfs, elves, and centaurs before the demon itself was finally trapped inside the casket of souls. Victory was had at last but at what uh, but at what a cost zombies and worse still stalk the land for there are few warriors left to destroy them the court of the boy king irian is said to be riven by petty squabbles and scheming advisers most folk live behind shuttered windows and bolted doors these days hospitality to a traveller such as you not yourself is but a memory now. That's a redundant reflexive which we discussed in the last book. It's uh, yeah, to a traveller such as you Many days of foot-wearying travel have brought you to Sanctuary, the, the royal court within the island known as the Cauldron, the furthest island of Ice Cap range. Uh, like Ice Cap Zone on Silent Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. Uh, sort of. Uh, you are ushered swiftly into an audience with the king. You are startled by his appearance. Most people still call him Boy King, but Irian has grown almost to almost to full stature now, and while he is still very strong and surely inexperienced in the arts of kingship, his voice is commanding and his manner assured. 
Greetings, he says, as you kneel before his throne. Oh, do please stand up. I already have all the groveling, um, all the grovellers I need here in sanctuary. I can scarcely do with another one. Come. He rises and leaves the throne room and marches along a narrow corridor to his personal chambers. Somewhat startled by his informality, you follow him. Look, he says, as he strides across to a table, picks up a black cloth embroidered with golden runes and gently polishes a large chunk of blue-white crystal. The crystal hums slightly and a ghostly scene appears in the midst of the room. A white-haired old man is sitting in the most cluttered study you have ever seen. Papers, crystal balls, bundles of bat's wings, bottles of herbs and a jumble of other other articles are scattered all over the floor and walls. Um, irritably, the old man looks up at you. Eh? What is it? He snaps. Uh, uh, Gareth, the hero, Gareth, whatever, the hero of whom I spoke is here. Uh, I relate once more what you told me, and perhaps you have learnt even more. Oh, yes. Hmm. Well, I suppose you've told him about the demon throne and explained the laws of fractured resonance and that the king interrupts the ghostly apparition. Time grows so short you can explain much better than I can. The old man's gaze turns upon you. He looks faintly disapproving. Harumph. Uh, very well. Then listen closely, young whippersnapper. I take it that at least you know about King Kral and the defeat of the bone demon of the bottomless pit. You shudder slightly. Everyone knows how the armies of the Bone Demon were finally confronted and the Bone Demon was imprisoned in the casket of souls in the barren expanse of the Plains of Peril, where the bottomless pit still smokes and churns to this day. This was some years past, but the scars of that terrible war mark Amarillia still. And you know of the casket of souls? You nod. Well, uh, when it was made, magic was woven into it to enable the demon's banishment to the outer plains. Unfortunately, however, there was a slight flaw in the way the magic was woven. Since that magic allowed a magical creature to be drawn out of your world, it also created a resonance allowing certain magical creatures into your world as well. I'm rather afraid, the old man says in a school... Uh, I'm rather afraid, the old man says in a schoolmasterish tone as he adjusts the slightly ridiculous lenses perched on his nose, uh, that a definitely magical creature has done just that, appeared in your world, that is, out of mine. I can't say we're sorry to see him leave us, but our gain is going to be your loss unless you can stop him emerging in his full power. Worse still, he is entering your world where the casket of souls was taken after the demon was banished at Castle Argent. The old, uh, the old man pauses for breath. He is named Zagor and he is a great wizard, one of the most powerful my world has ever seen. My world is called Titan. I suppose I suppose you've heard your scholars mention it, hmm? Great Alansia, with its wicked port black sand ruled by the wretched Lord Azur and his uh, and his corrupt cronies, the great civilizations of the old world, the crawling chaos of cool. You have heard of it. Well, anyway, I won't ramble on about my home. I'll become sentimental and waste time. Let's get back to Zagor. Uh, twice we have believed him slain, but twice he has resurrected himself. All that was left of his original form is a skeletal arm, but that is enough. When he was drawn into your world, his being became fused with the trapped demon, and now a demonic form of Zagor grows even as I speak. Although I am powerless to prevent it happening f uh, from the seclusion of my world, I detected Zagor being drawn into yours, and I was able to send some magic after him, some talismans of gold and daggers of silver. They will be scattered around the lair within which Zagor is now growing. Each of them will weaken him, so when you can, uh, so when you get there, be sure to collect as many as you can. You aren't, uh, you aren't sure you like the, uh, you like the way the old man just assumes you're going to march straight into the desolate, evil ruins of Castle Argent. It's hundreds of miles away. I don't like kilometers. Uh, you know, it's it's contrived because in this country we always use miles. It's it's contrived. The metric system, although legally the, uh, 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 well. Uh, um, Although the de facto, no, not the de facto, uh, the de jure, um, uh, the de jure, how you, you pronounce it, the legal measurement system. In terms of roads and traffic, miles are still, um, um, miles and yards and feeds are still used, and I prefer it. So. I'm going to say miles. It's hundreds of miles away across the frozen wastes and the dangerous monster infested icy seas, but he goes on talking anyway. This time, Zagor simply has to be destroyed. It's not enough to kill him. You'll have to make sure his body is burned to nothingness. I think nothingness is a tautology. I think you know it's either nothing or you know uh, putting a ness on the end is um, is 
uh, it's pointless because either either it's nothing or it isn't nothing. You know, uh, you'll have to make sure his body is burned to nothing in the heart fires below Castle Argent, where the gra uh, where the Grand Wizards of your world centered the conjuring of the Great Firewall from the outermost points of Amarillia. Though you will know all about that, of course. I thought this was merely a tale or a deception, murmurs the king sadly, until Gareth told me about certain changes made at Castle Argent. My own spies were able to verify those details. The old man's eyes look bright now. Ah, yes, the castle. It's metamorphosing, changing form, drawing Zagor's old magic and servants into it, strengthening him as he grows. Not all of that magic may be dark and evil. You may be able to find help there, certainly in addition to the items I have placed there. But I'm afraid that one of the mightiest and most dangerous of the demons, war dragons, one which escaped destruction in the final battle ten years ago, has something to do with the magical changes within the castle. It has learnt something of the ways of magic, and it seeks revenge for its defeat by, ally uh, by allying with Zagor to wreak havoc on all of Amarillia. Um, perhaps in its madness it thinks of him as the demon it once served, which of course Zagor is, in part. The ghostly scene begins to fade and tremble. Faint white sparks crackle at the edge of the crystal. The old man's voice rises in surprise and annoyance. Not yet, I should tell you about the... The crystal explodes into a thousand fragments. You and King Irian look down, stunned at the smoking remains of the table upon which it stood. You do not know where the magic which banished the old man back to his world... Um, you do not know from... Um, from where the magic which banished the old man back to his world came, but a feeling of evil and menace hangs in the air around you. Brave adventurer, the king beseeches you. I have no one else to send. My wizards give all they can, preserving the firewall which guards all Amarillia. My loyal knights and the few nobles I can trust have more work than they can perform, simply preventing this kingdom from tearing itself apart. I beg you, go to Castle Argent. Uh, uh, go to Castle Argent. A ship is readied for you. Destroy the wizard fiend who comes to ravish our land. Return to me after carrying out deeds worthy of the knighthood. I shall then grant you, with the weight of a world's fate resting on your shoulders, or so it feels, you cannot refuse the quest. Turn to paragraph one. At last. Forty-six minutes of this. Blimey. Okay, here we go. There's a picture of the port and the ship, etc. A ship has been ready to carry you westwards to the to the coastline of Tower Island, where the forbidding majesty of ruined cas Castle Argent lies. If you decide to set off immediately, turn to 220. If you want to spend some gold pieces purchasing equipment, turn to 56. If you want to try acquiring some extra gold for buying equipment, turn to 206. If you want to consult one of the king's sages for advice or help before you set sail, turn to 104. Okay, um... Okay, um... We are going to... We're going to, um, consult one of the King's Sages for advice or help before you set sail. So, turn to 154. I think this is... I think... If you're watching, William is an idiot. I think this is, uh, this is what you asked me to do. So, um... I'm trying to think about it. 154. Sanctuary has its fair share of dubious fortune tellers and charlatans, but the king's querulous old sage, you, yeah, Yondale, is said to have the sight, so you make your way to his chambers. When you enter, the ancient-looking wizard sage is in animated discussion with a merchant who is bearing a small wooden casket. He asks you what you want, and when you ask for his help, he snaps at you. This wretch wants five gold pieces for a mere grumnet of Barabangian shimmer lizard tails. It's an outrage. Pay him for me, and I'll tell you something of use to you. If you are willing to pay the five gold pieces, turn to 382. If you won't or can't pay, you can buy some equipment, turn to 56. Try to make some extra money, turn to 206. Or make for the ship to take you out of sanctuary, turn to 220. Okay, we're willing to pay the, uh, the five gold pieces, so turn to 56 do that now. No time to wait, considering all the time we spent reading the introduction. Okay. In the markets and shops of the pe... Wait a minute, what am, what am I doing? Wait a minute, I'm doing the wrong one. Oh, I chose the wrong... I went to the wrong paragraph. How stupid of me.
yeah, 380 do. That's what I wanted, not 56. Yeah, 380 do. I apologise for that. I'm being stupid. I'm a bit brain dead after reading all that introduction. I apologise. 382, there we go. That was the equipment buying bit. Okay, you pay the merchant. Okay, let's deduct five gold pieces. So we're now down to 11. Comma. You know, it's full stop. Or period, as the Americans call it for some reason. Okay, you pay the merchant and he hands the casket to the old man. Dumping it careless carelessly in a bronze dish, the sage turns his attention to you. Hmm, heading for Castle Argent, eh? You look startled at, at his patience. I think that's how you pronounce it. At knowing where you are headed. Perhaps he has the sight indeed. No, actually, the king told me. But in fact, I did have one of my visions about the place only the other day. Now, did I write it down? He scrambles up a rickety stepladder with an agility unusual in one so old and drags a thick leather-bound tome covered in dust from one of the topmost shelves. He fumbles with the pages then... Uh, then with a sh he fumbles with the pages. Then, with a shriek of triumph, he recites a verse or riddles to you. The night can be destroyed with the lions within the green. The hellhorn champion falls to the chevron. Uh, the chevrons in the white. The war dragon falls to the yellow cloistered stars. The ogre mutant falls to the goblets in the blue. The onyx staff empowers you to use these symbols true. Well, that's it, he says. I've no idea what it means, of course, but it is important. Rather disappointedly, you leave. Okay, so, um... Yeah, so it's important that, that, we, uh, that we remember this. Luckily, I already have it, um... I already have it written down. I'm going to... I'm going to copy... Um, I'm going to copy and paste uh, all that nonsense over to uh, um, over to my quote-unquote adventure sheet. So copy that and then put it over here. Let's put it here, but remove these things that I added. I know actually I'll keep them. There we go. Okay, yeah, so we've copied all that all that business down. That's lovely. Okay, now what are we doing? We are now going to we're now going to head for the ship, I think. Yeah, we're now going to head uh, we're now going to wait for the ship to take you to Tower Island. So it's under two hundred and twenty, let's go there forthwith. Okay, here we go. Uh, the glory of Amarillia is a fully armed war galley, and to your amazement, the captain is Barabang is a Barabang centaur. Centaurs are hardly renowned for seamanship, but the magical iron shoes on the centaur's feet allow him to walk on water. Slightly sacrilegious there, never mind. Um, as you discover when he literally walks aboard after you, there is a fair uh, northerly wind, Captain Caranus says as he sniffs at the uh, at the bitterly cold air we should get to the end of the ice cap islands without fog to worry uh, without fog um uh, without fog to worry about only icebergs and whatever monsters of the deep may wait in store eh? uh, the voyage bears out his optimism the great vessel skirts the warm stream of zephyrs and after some days turns southwest past the coast of the frozen lands but on the margins of the warm sea flows Fogs begin to spring up as you head for Tower Island itself. You just keep your fingers crossed and hope that no predators of the deep are sensing the great ship above them. If you want to spend a point of luck to avoid even the chance of such an encounter, turn to 44. Uh, we are going to do that, otherwise turn to 98. We're going to spend a point of luck, so we're going to put our luck down to 6, comma, there we go, and then we're going to go to 44. Fantastic. Can't be dealing with with monster encounters right now. Not towards the end of the video when I did all that introduction. After many days at sea, your vessel is within five miles of Tower Island itself. Even from that distance, you can see the great towered mass of Castle Argent rising into the leaden skies just beyond. I think that's how you pronounce it. Beyond the shoreline, the galley can go no further in the shallow bay. So you think the crew who brought you. Yeah, Think. So you thank the crew who brought you here and take your belongings into the stout rowing boat being lowered uh, being lowered for you. Um, Karanis shakes your hand firmly and says, 
We head for the River Geld, and hopefully a greeting from my own people, those few who remain in the lands upstream. We will come back for you when the moon is new, hoping for your safe return, and news of a triumph. If you are not, um, if you are not waiting, he pauses. We will come once more when the moon is new uh, over the world. All our hopes ride with you. You leave and row for the shore. Turn to seventy-five. Yep, seventy-five. Okay, you stand on the shoreline of Tower Island. Um, before you is a long straight stone road leading up to the gates of Castle Argent itself, but on either side of that road are many ruined buildings raised by orcs and zombies in a war against the Bone Demon. In the shattered ruins, little or nothing of any value or use to you is likely to be left after the, the destruction here. There may be some remnants of the demon's armies here, uh, scrounging what they can. However, if you want to explore the ruins, you may do so. Will you explore ruins to the west, turn to 269, explore ruins to the east, turn to 231, head straight for Castle Argent, turn to 191. We're going to head straight for Castle Argent, 190, 192. Did I say 191? 192. I'm tired, I have an excuse. Right. Now, the stone-built mass of Castle Argent stands before you. Its great iron-shod uh, iron gates lie at the end of the road, which then angle down into the earth so that any going into the castle must first enter by subterranean chambers. Above ground, the walls of the castle are far too high for you to climb. You see that the castle has a central keep with east and west wings, and on the side of the castle furthest from where you are... Uh, stands the northernmost great tower, rising to a spire among swooping seagulls. At its highest point is a throne room where scores of kings have undergone the ritual of the sword um, before ruling Amarillia from this mighty fortress. Surely you feel that is where the monster Zagor is growing in evil might. There is no time to lose. You stride forward to the seemingly unguarded citadel. The massive iron gates, their, their, their brass plaques now defaced by crude orcish scrawl, are closed. If you can and wish to, and wish to use, if you can and wish to uh, use an open spell to enter, turn to 103. If you cannot use a spell, your only option is to try to force the doors. Turn to six. Okay, we will decide what to do. Well, it's pretty obvious what we're going to do um, in the next video because we've been recording for nearly an hour now. So next video, I will be. I am on paragraph 191, and, I'm about, and I will decide whether to use a spell or force the doors open. I'll just write the paragraph number. 191, just in case I forget. One, no, it's two. It's dark, I can't see the keyboard. I need, need to turn the light on. Um, yeah, okay, put a comma there as well. Okay, so... Um, in the next video, I shall do the rest... I shall do the rest of paragraph 191 decide whether to use a spell or to force the doors down so thanks for watching and goodbye